Welcome to the watershed audit topic of how to ensure that stormwater ponds and other best management practices are providing maximum aquatic resource protection benefits. This is Richard Klein. I'm President of Community and Environmental Defense Services. We help folks throughout the nation with a wide variety of issues threatening a neighborhood or the environment, including aquatic resource protection. The purpose of a watershed audit is to ensure that all activities within a watershed are in full compliance with aquatic resource protection laws. This presentation focuses on one of about two dozen activities, stormwater management applied to residential, commercial, or other development projects, mostly constructed at the 1980s or so. You can download the comprehensive guidance manual on the left from our Watershed Audits webpage, along with the fact sheets you see on the right. Most of us assume that there is a massive army of government inspectors out there monitoring ponds and other stormwater best management practices to ensure that each is maintaining good working condition. While, while adequate inspection staffing does exist in some localities, this is not universally true. We might also assume that watershed or environmental advocacy groups are also out there filling in the gaps. Unfortunately, this is largely a myth as well. Most groups focus on policy issues, education, or restoration projects. Very few groups have ever inventoried watershed activities to ensure compliance. There are five topics which make up this presentation. With the knowledge provided by these topics, you can look at a small sampling of stormwater BMPs in your watershed and get a sense of maintenance quality. If you find that all are well maintained, then go on to the next regulated activity. If not, then pursue the suggestions uh, offered here and in the manual for providing local government with the public support essential to improving maintenance. About 80% of all Americans live in suburban urban areas. This means that the water is closest to our homes are degraded due to stormwater runoff and other impacts from our homes, businesses, streets, parking lots, and other impervious surfaces. This aquatic resource degradation is due to these five changes brought about by watershed development. For those of you not familiar with the term, a watershed is all that land which contributes water to a wetland, stream, river, lake, estuary, or some other type of water body. On the left, the red line delineates the 64,000 square mile Chesapeake Bay watershed. And any rain falling within the red line will eventually enter the bay or evaporate back into the atmosphere. The perimeter is formed by hilltops, ridgelines, and other high points which divide the watershed of one body from that of another water body. In general, about a fourth of the precipitation falling upon a watershed will soak into the soil to a depth below the root zone of trees or other vegetation. This infiltrated water will then flow through the earth until it encounters a well, a seep, a spring, a stream, a lake, or a tidal body. It is this process which provides the water entering a wetland or stream when a few days have passed since the last rain. The movement of rain or other precipitation into the soil is called groundwater recharge. Covering the land with streets and other impervious surfaces prevents recharge and increases surface runoff. By physical damage, we mean heavy equipment operating in wetlands or stream channels, as well as the removal of forest from near channel buffer areas and the floodplain. While the major bay watershed states have achieved tremendous success in slowing the pace of aquatic habitat destruction, it still occurs, and it can take decades to a century for a waterway to recover from this form of impact. This is why it's critical to preserve forest buffers along waterways and wetlands. Converting a forested watershed to one blanketed by homes can increase the frequency and severity of flooding by a hundredfold. In other words, flood water volumes and velocities that once recurred every hundred years before development can come annually once home construction is completed. 
The tremendous increase in the velocity and volume of floodwaters causes a dramatic increase in stream channel erosion. Part of the increase is due to replacing permeable forest soils with impervious surfaces like rooftops and asphalt. The other part is due to replacing natural channels with slow runoff velocity with very smooth street gutters and storm drains. These smoother surfaces allow runoff to gather quickly into massive scouring floods. Combined, these two mechanisms can cause a forest channel to erode to a width of two to eight times greater following watershed development, as you see at the bottom of the slide. Runoff from developed lands can transport more than 100 pollutants into waterways. In fact, most aquarium fish would die if placed to runoff collected from a suburban or urban street. A substantial portion of this pollutant originates from industrial smokestacks, car exhaust, or other air pollution sources. When this air pollution settled on the forest floor, much was removed when transported into the soil by percolating rain. But in a developed area, the pollution settles on rooftops, streets, and other impervious surfaces where it can soak into the soil. Instead, it washes away with the next rain. Other pollution sources include lawn fertilizers and pesticides, pet waste, and dumping oil down storm drains, to name but a few. Highly effective BMPs reproduce the forest floor effect with organic filters that allow treated runoff to infiltrate underlying soil. Scientists have found that a minimum amount of forest must be retained in a watershed to keep waters in a condition suited to sensitive fish, wading, or even swimming. To preserve high quality waters, a minimum of half the watershed must be forest. The poorest quality waters have less than 30% forest cover. Beginning with a study I published in 1979, a number of researchers have documented a direct relationship between the health of aquatic ecosystems and the extent of watershed development. This extent is usually expressed in terms of the percent of a watershed covered by buildings, streets, parking lots, and other impervious surfaces. In this table, we see that highly sensitive ecosystems, such as those supporting brook trout, perish when more than 2% of the watershed is covered by impervious surfaces. At an imperviousness of 25%, our waters become biological deserts devoid of most native aquatic organisms. The impact of stormwater on aquatic resources and streamside structures has been known for a long time. In fact, this slide shows that stormwater management has been around for about a century, at least in the form of large public works projects. Each step in this history was viewed as a panacea for stormwater impacts but each proved lacking with time. It would be arrogant to assume that the latest panacea, environmental site design, low impact development, will not evolve as well. Nevertheless, the past emphasis has always been on end of the pipe structural practices. With ESD and LID, the emphasis has shifted to non-structural measures placed before the storm drain. Here you see an example of the type of stormwater management practice before the 1970s. Toilet water and street runoff would be carried in the same combined sewer pipes to a wastewater treatment plant. This worked fine during low volume rains, but the sewers would overflow come higher volume floods, causing extensive pollution. Catch basins did capture gravel and coarser objects, but not In the early 1970s, dry ponds like the one you see in the upper left photo began to appear. As the name implies, a large opening at the bottom of the pond allowed each to drain completely following a storm. These ponds were intended to re reduce downstream flooding. Over time, the size of the pond steadily increased until regional ponds came into being. However, we soon learned that dry ponds and did little to protect aquatic resources from other stormwater. Earlier I mentioned end of the pipe structures. This is what I meant. The red dashed line defines the drainage area for the dry extended det detention pond on the right. 
There are 80 homes located within the 28-acre pond drainage area. The pond is the only stormwater facility serving this 28-acre area. Runoff from the drainage area enters inlets like the one you see on the left, then discharges into the pond at this outfall. Unfortunately, extending detention uh, provides very ineffective pollutant removal and poor aquatic resource protection. The large drainage area also increases the likelihood that this practice will eventually fail. In the 1980s and 90s, infiltration practices began to appear. The idea is simple. You excavate a trench in the sandy or other permeable soils, line the trench with filter cloth, and fill it with stone. You then divert runoff from nearby streets or other impervious areas into the stone fill trench where pollutants are removed and the filtered runoff soaks into the adjacent soils. An infiltration basin resembles a pond but is built on permeable soils and is designed so most runoff percolates down through the In around 2005, we started seeing LID and ESD, uh, and with it, smaller, highly effective BMPs spread throughout the development project, usually in places that would have been landscaped otherwise. They're placed at the edge of parking lots or at roof downspouts, so um, they're before the, the pipe. This approach mimics forest conditions and has the potential to allow development with very little aquatic resource impact. But ESD and LID are more than just highly effective practices to treat runoff. Here we have a distillation of ESD LID basic principles. The idea is design projects to be as compact as possible by minimizing road widths, uh, building multi-story rather than one sprawling one-story structure. It's easier to fit a compact broad project onto the least erodible portions of a site while preserving aquatic resource buffers and forest. The compact design reduces impervious area and makes it easier to locate these areas so they drain the soils suited to highly effective ESD LID practices. Here we see four typical ESD LID practices. By spreading the practices throughout the site, groundwater infiltrates the soil in a more natural, diffuse manner. It's hoped that the smaller drainage areas and the use of mulch will result in lower failure rates and better pollutant removal. While ESD and LID can halt the loss of additional waters due to new development, it also has the potential to restore those waters degraded by past growth. For example, let's say a one-acre fast food store is redeveloped as an auto parts store but with highly effective ESD LID practices. The uncontrolled runoff from the fast food store was degrading an average of 300 feet downstream. Since the new store drains to these highly effective practices, those 300 feet of waterway are no longer impacted. There has been a trend in some areas recently towards reliance upon in-channel stream restoration projects to restore degraded suburban urban waters. While these projects certainly have a role to play in restoration, they must follow the installation of runoff control measures throughout a developed watershed. Otherwise, the tremendous power of floodwaters could cause these in-channel measures to quickly fail. Finding stormwater BMPs is actually pretty easy. Most existing BMPs are ponds located at the downslope edge of proposed development projects. You're most likely to find BMPs in projects built in the 1980s or later. You could begin with aerial photos and look along the downslope area for ponds like that pictured in the upper right. Newer BMPs like ESD LID practices will be found before runoff reaches a storm drain inlet such as the one situated in the court in the lower right photo. The vast majority of BMPs can be evaluated from adjoining parking lots, streets, or other public areas. Please do not venture onto private property or walk past a no trespassing sign 
to evaluate a BMP. If this is necessary, then request the property owner's permission first. Most BMPs fall into one of three categories, ponds, infiltration, and buyer retention or filters. Most ponds are dry between storms while the most effective retain a permanent pool of water. Infiltration measures usually have an observation well frequently made of white plastic pipe. Buyer retention and filters have a surface depressed about a foot below the first point where runoff could overflow. Observation wells are common too. Here we see a comparison of the relative effectiveness of the three uh, BMP types. Clearly infiltration and buyer retention without an underdrain removes the most pollutants and also allows the treated runoff to recharge the groundwater table. This recharge provides the dry weather inflow to wetland streams and other waters. Filters can provide recharge too, unless they are fitted with an underdrain. Underdrains are used where soil is not very permeable or there is a shallow depth to rock or water. Now for topic four. With regard to ponds, we urge you to focus on those that hold a pool of water. These are the most effective ponds. Pollutant removal in ponds is all about storage volume. The more water, the more time pollutants have to settle from suspension. Over time, a pond captures sediment, which is then colonized by cattails and other vegetation. If a pond has lost more than half its original volume, then it needs to be cleaned. This graph is from the Chesapeake Bay Program's guidance for stormwater pollutant removal. Ponds belong to a group of BMPs known as stormwater treatment or ST measures. As this graph shows, a pond that stores the first half inch of runoff from impervious surfaces captures about 25% of the nitrogen entrained in that runoff. Most ponds are designed to store an inch of runoff when new. Such a pond captures 33% of the nitrogen. So as storage declines, so does pollutant removal. There is a popular misperception that vegetation enhances pollutant removal on a pond. While vegetation might take up some pollutants, most are released when the vegetation dies and decomposes. In fact, the table on the lower right shows a wet pond with marsh traps 3% less nitrogen than ponds lacking vegetation. Ponds are constructed in two ways. On flat sites, a pit is excavated to form the pond. On hilly sites, an earth embankment is placed across a shallow valley. Other two, embankment ponds are most likely to have safety issues. When viewing the dam forming an embankment pond, look for any low spots. If floodwater over overtops the embankment and concentrates at such a low spot, then the dam could wash out. Trees, animal burrows, or wetlands on the dam are also cause for concern and must be eliminated. Earlier we said to ignore ponds that don't hold a pool of water. These are dry or extended detention type ponds. Dry ponds trap zero pollutants. Extended detention ponds might trap 5 to 25 percent of the pollutants transported into them. However, both may fail in ways that cause the retention of water which enhances pollutant removal. But failures can be dangerous. It's better to retrofit these ponds so they can safely store a permanent pool of water. Infiltration basins look a lot like a dry or extended detention pond. To tell the difference, look for observation wells, or a stone trench on the floor, or the basin bottom which penetrates down into permeable soils. Also, the first point where runoff can exit will be at least a foot or two above the, the pond bottom. Over time, fine particles may accumulate on the basin floor, sealing the surface. These areas then hold water for longer periods. Eventually, wetland vegetation may grow in these areas. These clogged soils should be scraped away to restore infiltration.
With infiltration trenches, look for indications that it can no longer treat the first inch of runoff. This is best done with the rain gauge and float method you'll see a few slides from now. With dry swales, look for evidence that the surface is clogged, wet spots when several days have passed since the last rain, or wetland vegetation. Bayer retention will be the most common BMP in the future. Most consist of a pit three to five feet deep. The bottom may have a gravel layer, though the most of the pit is filled with a mixture of sand and organic matter resembling planting soil. The surface has a two to three inch layer of wood mulch. The mulch surface is depressed a foot below the point where runoff could exit first. Here you see four examples. Here you see a cross-section of a typical bioretention facility. The two most critical bioretention components is the surface layer of mulch or vegetation along with the highly permeable planting soil which allows runoff to percolate through the underlying soil where recharge occurs. Bioretention facilities must drain completely in 48 hours. So if you see standing water or wetland vegetation, repairs are needed. Note the storm drain inlet in the lower left. You'll see such an inlet in most bioretention facilities. The surface of the mulch must be at least 12 inches below the point where accumulating runoff could first enter the inlet. This 12 inch storage allows the facility to treat 90% of all the runoff it receives. If the storage depth is less than 6 inches, then cleaning is likely required. Nothing kills a BMP faster than sediment-laden runoff from soil exposed in the area draining to the BMP. It's imperative that exposed soil be protected with straw mulch, a tarp, or other measures as soon as possible following disturbance. Here we have the rain gauge and float method uh, mentioned earlier. Use this method when a half inch or more rain is predicted. The float, a stick, is placed at the point where a runoff could first exit. A string tied to the stick is tied off elsewhere. A rain gauge is placed next to the BMP. Come back after the storm. You'll recall that most facilities are designed to treat the first inch of runoff. So if the rain gauge holds less than an inch of rain, but the float was washed into the inlet, then the BMP lacks sufficient capacity. Here's a summary of indicators of poor BMP performance. You have the option of working with a BMP owner to get a problem resolved or to report it to an enforcement agency. The next topic will walk you through the pros and cons of both methods. Topic 5. You'll encounter two types of problems, those rare ones which pose an imminent threat to public uh, safety and all others. The upper photo shows a dam that just washed out. This poses a major threat to downstream residents. If you had visited this pond before and saw low spots, you could have prevented the washout by reporting it immediately. But most problems will be like that on the bottom, a full pond that no longer traps pollutants but isn't an imminent threat. In our Storm Water Guidance document, you'll find advice on locating who enforces BMP maintenance in your area. On the left, you'll see pointers for making an initial report or referral to an enforcement agency. On the right is an example of what you could say during a report by phone or by email. Again, most of the problems you're firing are not of the imminent threat variety. In these cases, consider making a neighborly contact with the BMP owner first. Uh, if the BMP has maintenance problems, then the inspection agency is probably overworked and hasn't visited the site recently. By working with the owner, you can accomplish two things. Get the problems fixed more quickly and establish a working relationship. BMP owners may be businesses or homeowner associations active in your watershed. They could become important allies in this and other work that you do.
We call BMP owners responsible parties. The two photos on the left show examples where it's obvious who the party responsible for a BMP is. In this case, the convenience store owner and the association representing the homeowners. In the case of the homeowners, those living closer to the BMP may be your best friends in getting it fixed. After all, a well-maintained pond can be a real asset to nearby homeowners. Otherwise, you can try uh, local GIS uh, systems to locate who the owner of the BMP may be. So what happens when a responsible party doesn't cooperate or an enforcement agency fails to act? First of all, these will be rare instances. Your first step, though, should be to contact the official who represents you on the legislative body that oversees the enforcement agency. This will be a city council, county commissioners, aldermen, etc. If you can show you tried to work cooperatively and got nowhere, then it's likely the official will make some calls. When all else fails, there's always litigation, but this must be an option of last resort, and you should exhaust each of the steps shown here on the right. Most of the time, an issue will be resolved by the time you reach the threat of litigation. Sometimes, though, there's a need to establish a legal precedent. In this case, you may want to go to court as quickly as possible. Here you see a stormwater pond full of sediment. Then the same pond below after being cleaned in response to a citizen referral to the enforcement agency. If your local stormwater inspection program has been starved for staff and other resources, then don't be surprised if you find lots of problems. And don't blame the inspectors. Instead, mount a public campaign like the one described on the right to provide the agency with the resources they need to do their job. Far too many newcomers make the mistake that they need to have a friendly relationship with decision makers. While such a relationship can be desirable, it's far more important that these officials respect you. In other words, when weeks or months go by without improvements, then it's time to start mobilizing voters to support your call for change. And the place to begin may be with those who live next to failing BMPs. Many BMPs are located next to homes, particularly ponds. These BMPs could be a tremendous asset to the residents. Well-maintained wet ponds can increase home resale value and serve as recreational areas. A poorly maintained pond can become a real nuisance. We found that a fourth to half of those who live near BMPs are willing to keep an eye out for maintenance needs and even perform simple maintenance like cleaning obstructions from low flow pipes or cutting saplings from earth embankments. The sample letter and fact sheet shown here were written for BMP neighbors. Of course, there is another benefit to engaging BMP neighbors. Of all watershed residents, they have the strongest motivation to ensure that stormwater programs are adequately funded and that new laws are enacted. These neighbors are a constituency never tapped before a number in the thousands. Please let us know what you find and how corrective action progresses by completing this brief report for and posted at ceds.org slash BMP report. With enough reports, this database could develop into a tool we can use to identify localities that are doing particularly well. By learning why their problem is working well, we can help others do the same. Similarly, it can allow us to identify jurisdictions not doing so well who are in need of additional public support. Thank you for taking the time to view this presentation. Please give us a call or send us an email if you have any questions. Or if you're ever concerned about any other issue affecting your neighborhood or the environment, please don't hesitate to contact CEDS. Thank you.